Everyone, uh, welcome to this episode of Up in Arms. My name's Scott Hurst. I'm the curator of Asian and African collections, and this is the Ming Sword. So this is certainly one of the most visually striking objects in the collection, and probably one of the most ornate examples of Ming Dynasty uh, metalwork anywhere. So the Ming Dynasty ruled China from the fall of the Mongol Yuan Dynasty um, until their own eventual demise um, and the subsequent rise of the Qing Dynasty in the 17th century. So fun fact, the dynastic name Ming actually means bright, shining or light. So Ming Dynasty literally means the Bright Dynasty, which is um, quite apt, I think, considering we're talking about a sword which is literally covered in gold and gemstones, shiny all around. Now, unfortunately, uh, surviving examples of Ming Dynasty arms and armor are very rare indeed. So that makes this sword all the more important to the Royal Armouries collection. So this sword is of a Chinese form known as a Zhan. Zhan is found throughout China, throughout most of Chinese history, in fact. But the first mention comes from around the seventh century BC. Um, so we're talking about the spring and autumn period or the um, first half of the Eastern Zhao Dynasty. So in Chinese tradition, the Zhan is referred to as the gentleman of weapons because of its refined, elegant form. So along with the spear, the saber, and the staff, the Zhan is known as one of the four main weapons used in Chinese martial arts. In fact, the Zhan is probably the earliest form of sword to appear in Chinese history. So a Zhan is characterized by essentially its straight double-edged blade, usually terminating in a spear point. Sometimes they can be rounded off. The hilt, doesn't normally feature any quillens as we would recognize them in Europe. Um, so generally what you'll have is some, uh, some kind of molded disc in the plane of the blade. Uh, you may have some kind of diminutive lobes or wings uh, that extend out at the side, uh, which will offer some protection to the hand. Today, the Zhan is perhaps most recognizable as uh, the sword used by Tai Chi practitioners, and it is often referred to as the Tai Chi sword. However, by the time of the Ming Dynasty, the Zhan as a military weapon was pretty much obsolete. In fact, by the time of the Han Dynasty, from around 202 BC to 220 AD, um, the Zhan had already largely fallen out of favor in terms of military use and had been supplanted by the Dao. So the Dao is characterized by its uh, curved blade. Um, earlier examples do tend to have straighter blades, but um, generally they're curved. The blade is single-edged, and the hilt will usually have a disc guard, um, similar to what you see on Japanese swords, the Suba. Nonetheless, the Zhan remains very relevant indeed within courtly culture. Um, diplomacy and politics. It became used as the go-to ceremonial sword of China. It was used as a presentation piece. Um, it denoted status, wealth, prestige, power. So yes, it fell out of use within military circles, but it retained a lot of symbolic power within China. And indeed, this is still true today. Since 2008, uh, Chinese naval um, cadets, naval officers, have been issued with a Zhan type sword as their presentation or ceremonial blade. So as you can see, this example definitely falls within the category of ceremonial presentation pieces. It's absolutely covered with decoration, beautiful gold work, uh, gems, engraving. It is a stunning example. So despite the overall quality of the sword, the beautiful work on the scabbard and the hilt, the blade is not quite so good. Um, we think that the blade is actually of a later date, a later addition to the sword itself, of local Tibetan manufacture. It is pattern welded, but overall not of a similar quality to the rest of the sword. 
and actually it is very difficult to actually get the blade out of the scabbard, um, certainly without conservation assistance, which is why we won't be demonstrating that on film today. So the centerpiece of this entire arrangement is obviously the monstrous visage which dominates the hilt and appears to be devouring the blade and the scabbard. Now this imagery appears throughout most of China, Japan, Tibet, uh, into India, throughout much of South, uh, Southeast Asia in fact. And it's also common to both Buddhism and Hinduism. So what does this represent? It's not easy to actually sum up in a neat little package because there are so many different interpretations of this depending on uh, region, religion. There's so many interpretations. But essentially, um, within Sanskrit, it is known as a Kirtimukha, or face of glory. In Tibetan, it's referred to as Chiba, which uh, somewhat obscurely translates as that which resembles nothing. Uh, which doesn't really help with any kind of um, interpretation. In Balinese mythology, um, it's referred to as Boma, um, which is a god of the earth, um, essentially the son of Mother Earth. It can also be interpreted in a few more specific ways, such as a representation of uh, the cycle of creation and destruction, death, uh, birth, rebirth, uh, infinity, the progress of time, lots of very specific ideas. But generally, this, the Kirtimukha or Chiba, is referred to or considered a, uh, a symbol of protection and guardianship. It's often found above temples, for example. And in fact, the Kirtimukha imagery is actually repeated down the length of the scabbard. Just here we have many examples. And actually, though it's not necessarily obvious to start with, this sword is covered in Buddhist imagery and symbology. So if we look around the outside of the pommel just here, we have the eight Buddhist symbols of good augury. So around the outside of the pommel here, we have the wheel of law, the standard, the treasure jar, the pair of fish, the endless knot, the lotus, the parasol, and the conch shell of victory. So just here is the inscription that reads honorific or precious swords. Uh, this is a further reference to Buddhist symbolism um, and the jewels or emblems associated with monarchy, which include the uh, precious wheel, the precious jewel, precious queen, precious minister, precious elephant, and the precious horse. And finally, just here on the sword, we have a representation repeated of the symbolic and legendary weapon, the Vajra, which is essentially a symbolic representation of the irresistible force of a thunderbolt. And this is repeated several times along the length of the scabbard. So the overall style of the decoration is very similar indeed to several other objects, in fact, um, that can be linked to the Serfu Monastery in central Tibet, which gives us a nice idea as to where and when this sword may have appeared. So Tibetan Buddhism first got its uh, grips into China during the uh, reign of the Mongol Yuan dynasty. But it was reinforced and I suppose more solidly established during the Ming dynasty. In fact, the head of the Serfu monastery in Tibet, he actually served as a tutor to the young Yongle emperor who, ser uh, who reigned sorry, from uh, 1403 to 1424, and he is known to have returned to Tibet with gifts presented to him by the emperor personally. We know that certainly in 1409 he returned with gifts, and we suspect there was an earlier um, exchange of gifts in 1407, which is all very compelling evidence. So because of this anecdotal evidence, this um, apparent exchange of gifts, because of the overall um, Buddhist uh, symbology, the Tibetan style of the sword itself, we suspect that this sword was produced in the court of the Yongle Emperor, probably for presentation to a, uh, an allied Tibetan ruler, or, as I've already suggested, as a presentation piece, a ceremonial gift to one of the powerful Tibetan Buddhist monasteries. So if you would like to come and see the Ming sword in person, you can find it 
in the Oriental Gallery on the fourth floor of the Royal Armouries Museum in Leeds. So thanks for watching everyone, hope you've all enjoyed. Um, if you do want to support the museum, we are a charitable organisation, so if you can or want to, please do uh, donate. Um, but for now, the best way of supporting this channel and this series is to like and subscribe. Thank you.